There's increasing talk about bringing Palestinian refugees to the West. Is this a good idea? I'm going to look at why Arab countries aren't taking them and what happened when large numbers of Palestinian refugees went to Jordan and to Lebanon. Spoiler alert, it did not go well. And I'll look at the attitudes of Palestinian people to see if they'll fit in in Britain. Well, three quarters of them support Hamas slaughtering civilians, so they'll definitely fit in on university campuses and at the Green Party conference. The left say the Palestinian refugees are completely safe, but then the left also say that this is a woman, so let's not take their word for it. Right when politician Lee Anderson has warned that Labour will open the borders to Hamas militants and give them council houses, Lee has been criticised for his inflammatory language, but he's not even exaggerating. A Labour council in Sadiq Khan's London genuinely gave a council house to a senior member of Hamas. Hamas chief Mohammed Qasim Sawala was given a council house in the London borough of Barnet while he was running terror operations in the West Bank. Next time you look at your tax return, know that your money is being taken off you to pay for a nice house for a terrorist who hates you. Anyway, let's have a look at the calls for refugees to come here. There are 2.2 million people in Gaza, which is described by left-wing people as an open-air prison, and they're clearly suffering under Israel's military action and under Hamas. Labour's Jess Phillips said that... And in fact, all of the Gazans that we resettled into Birmingham Yardley uh, were actually doctors and are bringing huge amounts of resource. And that actually our communities, even in the face of the racism she talks about, are ready with open arms to help. Yeah, Gaza's got the magical ability to simultaneously be an open-air prison camp and the world's number one medical training facility. There are thousands, tens of thousands of orphans in Gaza currently who have no immediate family, who may be, would very well be ill, who have aunties and uncles uh, and cousins here in the UK. So we've already taken a lot of them then, have we, Jess? Actually, in most people's immediate family in Gaza, certainly children, are all dead. Well, why do they need to seek asylum then? Labour MP Sam Tarry insists they're all doctors and academics and it's horrible that they're having to pay thousands of pounds to get across the border at Rafa. Because many of those people are already, you know, are doctors they are uh, academics. You know, the Gazan people are highly, highly skilled and uh, incredibly intelligent and well-educated workforce of people. Nobody should be having to pay tens of thousands of pounds to get across the border at Rafah. I mean, it's nice that Sam's concerned about what Palestinians have to pay, but how about being concerned about what the British taxpayer has to pay? In America, prominent Democrats have urged the government to accept refugees from Gaza. I think there's something to be said about the region's partners being able to support and step up Palestinians. However, that does not abdicate the United States from our historic role that we've played in the world of accepting refugees and allowing people to restart their lives here. The calls for refugees to come to the West have come from Israel as well. Far-right Israeli politician Simcha Rothman says that if the West really cared about the plight of Gazans, it would accept them as refugees. Although, is he motivated by concern for Gazans, or is he just thinking about nicking their land while they're in the Dole office in Birmingham? If it's such a good idea for the West to take them, it's surely a better idea for Israel to take them. Israel is in need of workers. It previously issued 18,000 permits to Gazans, allowing them to cross into Israel and work. That's stopped now, I can't imagine why, so they're filling these roles with people from India. But if Gazan refugees are safe to come to Britain, they're surely safe to go to Israel, and it's a much shorter bus trip. And Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah urged Lebanese authorities to open the sea in order to flood Europe with a new wave of migrants. Well, I'm sure the leader of Hezbollah wouldn't recommend it if it was bad for us. We're told by left-wingers that the people of Gaza are just poor, innocent civilians who aren't responsible for the actions of Hamas. Although the people of Gaza did elect Hamas in 2006. But hey, everyone makes mistakes sometimes, like accidentally voting in Islamist militants. That's that's why pencils have erasers. So let's have a look at the attitudes of the people of Gaza. I assume they just want peace and to coexist in harmony with Israel? Well, Dana Abukamar is a Gazan studying law at the University of Manchester. Here's what she had to say about the Hamas attacks of October the 7th when Islamic militants raped and killed Israeli civilians. They are full of pride. They, this, this was, this is the first time that something like this happens um, in modern day history. For 16 years, Gaza has been under blockade. And for the first time, they are actively resisting. They are not on the defense. And this is truly a once in a lifetime experience. And everyone is, we are both in fear, but also 
in fear of what how how Israel will re retaliate and how we've seen it retaliate overnight uh, and the missiles that it's launched and the attacks. But also, we are full of pride. We're really, really full of joy of, of, of what has happened. And Hiba Al Hayek is a Palestinian who sought asylum in Britain, claiming that her life was at risk from Hamas. So you'd think she wouldn't celebrate when Hamas slaughtered other people. Well, just after the October 7th attacks, she was photographed in a pro Palestine march parading pictures of Hamas paragliders. These aren't isolated incidents. Rather than being horrified that Hamas raped and slaughtered civilians, most Palestinians seem to revel in it. Polls show that three quarters of Palestinian civilians support the October 7th attacks, and one quarter know to keep their mouth shut when someone asks them a tricky question in a poll. And a global survey conducted by the ADL revealed that a whopping 93% of Palestinians have anti-Semitic beliefs, and 7% seem to be immune to indoctrination. Labour politicians say that the Gazans are doctors who should be allowed to work here, so isn't it slightly worrying that three quarters of them think that it's okay to murder Jews? I think the last thing this country's health system needs is a tune of Nazi Harold Shipman's some people say that this shows that the attitudes of Palestinians are completely alien to British culture and values. Sadly, they'd fit right in. We've seen escalating levels of aggression and violence directed at Jews in Britain and at regular Brits as well. Just last week, two men, Walid Sadawi and Amr Hussein, appeared in court accused of a machine gun terrorism plot to attack Jews in the northwest of England. A Jewish safety organisation, the Community Security Trust, said that the allegations were part of a trend of rising anti-Semitic crime levels. And this this guy, Ahmed Alid, was just sentenced to 44 years in prison after trying to murder a Christian housemate in his sleep and stabbing a 70 year old man to death in protest against Israel and Zionism. There's now so much anti-Semitism in Britain that we're a net exporter of Islamic anti-Jewish terrorism. The Texas synagogue terrorist was from Blackburn in England. So would allowing in thousands more Palestinians present a security risk to Britain? Well duh. I mean how would you discern who's Hamas? It's not like they'd turn up and apply for asylum still with an AK-47 and wearing a bomb vest or have a Hamas tattoo on their arse, they'd spin some sob story about being oppressed by Hamas with help from the charities and lawyers who know how to trick our asylum system. Given that high level Hamas chiefs have been allowed to live in the UK and even given council houses, I don't trust our border control to filter out militants. About half a million people have been granted refugee status in Britain since 2016. The sheer scale of asylum applications means it's impossible to properly vet each application. And it's not just Jews that need to worry. We've seen escalating harassment and attacks on politicians. Ironically, left-wing politicians haven't escaped the attacks. I guess the communists and Islamists feel betrayed by them. Here's Labour's Lindsay Hoyle being accosted. A ceasefire, yeah you did. No, and you still did it, you did it on purpose. Why don't you want children to stop being killed, Mr. Hoyle? I'm not touching anyone. Mr. Hoyle, Mr. Hoyle, why don't you want children to stop being killed? Why don't you want a You want a ceasefire? If left-wing politicians were smart and capable of learning the lessons of history, they wouldn't let people into the country who will attack them. But then again, if left-wing politicians were smart and capable of learning the lessons of history, they wouldn't be left-wing. And why won't Arab countries take Palestinians? I mean, that would seem to make much more sense. They're much closer and more culturally similar, with a fondness for hanging off the back of a Toyota Hilux, killing homosexuals and not putting milk in tea. Mainstream media have pointed this out. Imagine Poland and Romania not taking Ukrainian refugees. And Arab countries have experience in handling large numbers of refugees. Egypt already has about 9 million refugees, including 300,000 Sudanese fleeing the terrible war there, which Western leftists are silent about for some reason. The reason is that they can't blame Jews for it. And if Egypt accepted Palestinian refugees, it could use them as a bargaining chip to get aid and influence in the West, so it seemed to make sense. But Egypt's president, El Sisi, is adamant that Egypt won't be accepting any Palestinian refugees. <laughs> على الرفض التام للتهجير القسري للفلسطينيين ونزوحهم إلى الأراضي المصرية في سيناء إذ أن ذلك ليس إلا تصفية نهائية للقضية الفلسطينية وإنهاء لحلم الدولة الفلسطينية المستقلة and this is the border between Gaza and Egypt to show that they're serious about not letting anyone through. Wow, imagine a Western country having a border fence like that. I guess we just don't have the technology to build it. Jordan's King Abdullah II, who's a cool guy, gave a similar message. No refugees in Jordan, no refugees in Egypt. 
that is a red line. Uh, because I think that is the plan by certain of the usual suspects to try and create de facto issues on the ground. This is a situation of humanitarian dimension that has to be dealt inside of Gaza and, uh, and, and the West Bank and not to try and push the Palestinian challenge and their future onto other people's shoulders. The message from Arab countries around Gaza is that if the Palestinians leave the land, they'll effectively lose any claim to it. I mean, this is the message they say to appease the Muslim world who might be angry that they're not helping their Muslim brothers in Gaza. The real reason is that it would bring Islamic militants into the countries who would then attack Israel and attack their host countries, who already have their own problems with Islamic militants backed by Hamas, such as Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. And they're not speculating, they're drawing on the lessons of history. The countries around Israel used to regularly try and wipe Israel off the map to kill or expel the Jews and give the land to the Palestinians. Despite being vastly outnumbered, for example in the Six Day War in 1967, Israel was outnumbered 3 to 1 as Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Iraq joined forces, it always went pretty badly for the Palestinians. Instead of getting all the land from the river to the sea, after each military loss they had to turn around to Israel and say, yeah, well about all that unpleasantness, uh, no hard feelings right? Can we come back? It's the palace cycle. Attack Israel, Israel retaliates, cry. So after the Six Day War, Israel occupied the West Bank, forcing the Palestinian militants across the border into Jordan, the country, not the glamour model. From here, they launched attacks on Israel. This obviously wasn't ideal for Jordan as it destabilised the country in two ways. It brought Jordan into direct conflict with Israel as Israel retaliated, fighting against a combined Palestinian and Jordanian military. And there was now a Palestinian army inside Jordan that threatened the Jordanian state. As the Arab world started pouring military aid to the Palestinian militants in Jordan, they grew in power and arrogance. An observer describes them driving around Amman, which is a city in Jordan, in jeeps with loaded weapons, extorting money from locals, disregarding rules and army checkpoints. There were kidnappings and violence against Jordanians, even against the military. The future Jordanian Prime Minister Zaid al-Rifai described the Palestinian militants killing a soldier, beheading him and playing football with his head in the area where he used to live. It didn't stop there. Palestinian militants tried to overthrow the Jordanian monarchy. They hijacked planes and tried to assassinate King Hussein of Jordan and later succeeded in assassinating the Jordanian Prime Minister Waspi Tal. Jordan had given the Palestinians refuge and the Palestinian militants in return tried to destroy their country. Pushed to breaking point, King Hussein ordered the Jordanian military to attack the Palestinian militants. Syria sent 10,000 troops to help the Palestinians fight Jordan, but the Jordanian military triumphed and eventually the Palestinian militants were driven out of Jordan and into Lebanon. Now, let's have a look at Lebanon. I mean, you'd think after being driven out of Jordan, the Palestinian militants would have learnt their lesson and just wanted to live a peaceful life and contribute to the country which was gracious enough to host them. Don't you know they're mostly doctors? Well, they didn't. They moved on to Lebanon and caused a civil war. Lebanon was one of the most peaceful and prosperous countries in the Middle East and the only Christian majority country. Hmm, I wonder if there's a link there. It was tolerant and westernised. Its capital Beirut was referred to as the Paris of the East, but it was actually better as there was less dog shit on the pavement and fewer French people. The Lebanese were proud of their successful multiculturalism with Maronite Christians, Muslim and Druze living side by side. It was as diverse as any post-BLM advert. And it was open to people from Middle Eastern countries who came to study at its universities and work in its thriving economy. Now the country is a basket case and millions of Christians have fled. So what happened? Lebanon was about two thirds Christian when it gained independence from France in the 1940s. But the Muslim population grew faster than the Christians and there were waves of Palestinian refugees. After one of their wars in 1948 when Arabs attack Israel, lose and then cry about it, Palestinian refugees fled to Lebanon where they were welcomed by the Lebanese who thought they would be temporary guests. Their great grandchildren are still there. Imagine letting your mate crash on your couch after he's had a bust up with his missus and a century on his grandkids are still on your couch and you're called a horrific monster because you're only letting them stay on the couch? That's Lebanon. And you know how I was just talking about the Palestinian militants who tried to overthrow the Jordanian government but were then kicked out in 1970? Well they moved on to Lebanon, backed and armed by Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries. They stirred up a burgeoning conflict between Christians and Muslims and precipitated a civil war in Lebanon that raged for 15 years, left hundreds of thousands dead and the exodus of a million people. The country has never recovered. Left wing scientists are still baffled as to how this could happen as it goes against the scientific formula that diversity equal strength. But you can understand why Arab countries are now a little bit wary of accepting Palestinian refugees. Here's Christian refugee Brigitte Gabriel describing what happened in Lebanon. Uh, we were living the good time and fortunately all that began to change. Um, 
by the 70s because of two things. The, lar the enlargement of the Islamic population in Lebanon, because we Christians marry one spouse until death do us part. Uh, we don't have many kids. Muslims, on the other hand, are allowed to marry up to four wives at a time. Now, of course, not all of them do it, but enough of them do it that in our country, in Lebanon, the, by the 70s, the Muslims became the majority. Mm -hmm. And once they became the majority, they started massacring the Christians and killing the Christians. Um, I remember in 1974, um, we stopped traveling. Um, we used to go spend Christmas and Easter in Beirut with the rest of my family. And we stopped traveling, and I would ask my father, why aren't we going to Beirut for Christmas this year? And my daddy would say to me, well, we just decided to stay home this year. And, you know, I couldn't understand why. And later I learned this because Muslims started setting up fly-by-night uh, checkpoints and they would stop Christian cars traveling. And when they would get people out of the car and look at their ID and find out that this is a Christian family traveling because in Lebanon, our religion is written on our national ID, on, our, on your driver's license, on your passport. So when they see that this is a Christian family traveling, they would get everyone out of the car and shoot them in cold blood. So we became prisoners to our homes and our cities and our communities. Um, and that's the reason why we stopped going anywhere. By 1975, uh, that's when the war broke out, the Civil War. And the war broke out because Muslims walked into a church on a Sunday morning and began uh, firing, shooting at Christian worshipers and uh, injured hundreds and killed four people. And that's what started out the all-out uh, all war. And um, it was a very difficult time for the Christians because as the Muslims organized and now supported by the oil money flowing out of Saudi Arabia and all the Muslim countries, they wanted to basically use Lebanon as a base from which to fight Israel, kill the Jews, and drive them into the sea using Lebanese democracy and Lebanese open-mindedness and tolerance uh, to do exactly that. And that's really when my world turned upside down and, and, and um, it changed. Uh, Le Lebanon was so multi-faith and multicultural. So we had Druze, Muslims, Christians, Protestants. The majority were Christians. We were over almost 70% Christians when we got our independence in the 40s. But because of the way Muslims multiply, you know, with the multiple wives and multiple kids, in 30 years, they became the majority. Mm -hmm. And when, when we got our independence from France and Lebanon, um, because we are, you know, Judeo-Christians, you know, come from Judeo-Christian culture, we're very fair. So we made sure we divided the government to make sure that Muslims have representation. So the, the president of the country was Christian, the prime minister was a Muslim, um, the prime minister, um, you know, the secretary of state. We had different assignments for different religions but the Muslims became the majority. And once they became the majority, they were no longer tolerant of the people who took them in and accepted them and included them in the country. Mm -hmm. They felt they were not a part of the country. They felt they were a part of the Islamic Ummah or the Islamic nation. Okay. So when they turned against their brethren, Christians who lived in the same country and Jews, um, but specifically the Christians, they began massacring us in large numbers because they thought we are in power now and therefore we set the rules on how things should be. And that's really what drove the country into war. We had the problem controlled when it was only the Christians in Lebanon and the Muslims in Lebanon. But what aggravated the situation was the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan um, who came to Lebanon. And Lebanon was the only country who took them in. Uh, because we were the only country that accepted the third wave of Palestinian refugees, while the Muslim countries did not want them. And um, that's what really changed the situation. That's what tipped the scale. The way Western leftists talk about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon is very revealing. They say they're victims of apartheid and second-class citizens who don't have the same say in politics and society as Lebanese people. We've all seen horrific images of Gazans being injured and killed, and I'm sure everyone feels sympathy for them. To be honest, the best thing for the people of Gaza would be the eradication of Hamas. Hamas are responsible for the deaths of Gazans. They kill anyone who questions them. They kill gays. They steal food and medical supplies from humanitarian trucks. Leftists screech that Israel is committing genocide. Well, if they are, it's the most useless genocide in human history as the population of Gaza has exploded over the past few decades. 
should probably use a different word. They know they can't defeat Israel in a straight fight because Israel is basically an outpost of the American military. So Hamas's greatest weapon against Israel is public opinion, which they can turn against Israel by parading footage of dead children and civilians. But to do this, Hamas needs civilian deaths, so they cynically put their weaponry and facilities under schools and hospitals. Will left-wing politicians succeed in their mission to bring millions of Palestinians to the West? Of course they will, and anyone who questions it will be decried as racist. The West lost its balls years ago and is now a morass of low testosterone feminised men and angry childless women. Brits have had all sense of unity or nationhood bludgeoned out of them and our history has been rewritten by blue haired genderqueer communists. We've been indoctrinated into believing that the Crusades, which were a defensive war, were evil white Christian colonialist oppressors. Instead of Christianity, our religion is now neo-Marxist social justice with its twisted anti-Western narrative of oppressors and oppressed, colonised and colonisers, diversity equals strength. Social justice is a powerful ideology, so powerful that even Mia Khalifa, who is the daughter of Christians who fled Lebanon, although I get the impression Mia is not a practising Catholic just now, well Mia supports Hamas as freedom fighters and is vicious about Israel. Although maybe this is just another way of her getting back at her dad, I'm sensing some daddy issues there. Islamists even threatened to kill Mia because she wore a hijab in one of her saucy videos. Although to be fair, how can they be sure it's her? If Mia Khalifa can simp for Islamists after all that, then the rest of the West have no chance. So it's inevitable that we'll take Gazans. This won't be good for British Jews, and ironically, it won't be good for Palestinians left behind in Gaza. Rising anti-Semitism in the West is making more Jews see Israel as their only safe haven, and the rise of the far left and Islamists in Western politics means that Western support for Israel will dwindle. So Israel's future will be as a more isolated, entrenched state with less of a moderating influence from the West. Anyway, thanks for listening. If you want to support me making these videos or buy me a pint, there are links below. And if you become a patron, you get access to patron only content. At the moment, there's a deep dive into what the establishment gets wrong about in immigration. You can watch right now. Okay, thanks for listening. I've been Leo. Bye bye. Bye.